In part one, we talked about the global temperature increase in 2024. And in part two, we talked about the fact that the Earth will soon become uninhabitable and that this phenomenon is universal and has already happened in several countries. In today's part three, I'd like to point out some of the reasons why this prediction will inevitably become a reality. Firstly, let's look at something called the Kuznets curve. The Kuznets curve is, unsurprisingly, the curve proposed by Kuznets. It looks like this and shows that income inequality increases and then decreases as an economy grows. Let's look at the graph a bit more. Income inequality increases as the center of industry shifts from labor-intensive industries such as agriculture to commerce and industry, industries with economies of scale. Accumulated capital enables larger factories and more efficient labor, which leads to higher incomes. So the gap between the haves and have-nots grows larger and larger as industry develops. However, once industry reaches a certain level of sophistication, the inequality index decreases again. There are many reasons for this, but let's consider just two. Democracy. Many studies have shown that capital or production precedes democracy. It's a simple principle. When you're struggling to make ends meet, you don't have time to think about ideology. You just want to produce more. But soon people realize that the overall pie is too small for everyone to eat, so they try to increase the pie. But then they realize that even though the overall pie has grown enormously, the slice they can eat is not getting much bigger. That's when they start to think about sharing the pie as much as growing the pie. That's when they start to think about the concept of equality. The concept of equality is an important concept of how to distribute. And depending on how you define it, it can be capitalism, it can be democracy, it can be communism, but whatever the ideology, you want to distribute more than before. The second reason is public goods. When a country's industry develops and becomes livable, the state wants to enhance public goods through taxation. This is why the inequality index rises and then falls as national income rises. This is a common phenomenon around the world. But why did I explain the Kuznets curve? Because there is a variant of the Kuznets curve called the environmental Kuznets curve, which shows that in the early years, the income gap between rural, urban, and industrial sectors increases. But as the economy reaches a mature stage, the income distribution improves and inequality decreases. The theory that this curve can be applied to the environment instead of income inequality is the environmental Kuznets curve. As shown in the figure, the x-axis of the environmental Kuznets curve is national income as in the original, but the y-axis is different. The y-axis has been changed from degree of inequality to level of environmental pollution. It can be seen that the environment deteriorates up to a certain level with hard economic growth. But after that point, the level of pollution decreases as the level of income increases. As I mentioned earlier, as people become more affluent, they want a cleaner world. And as they become more affluent, governments invest in public goods. These public goods include parks and forests. Also, electricity is essential for industrial development, and clean energy is difficult to use in the early stages of economic growth. No other energy source can match fossil fuels in terms of efficiency. In a way, it's a no-brainer. During periods of economic growth, efficient fossil fuels are the only way to go. You don't have the technology or the budget for nuclear power, and you need to grow rapidly, so fossil fuels are the way to go. Only countries that are already on the growth frontier will be interested in wind, hydro, and solar, which are more environmentally friendly than efficient energy. In theory, this is because of the law of diminishing returns, but that's beside the point, so let's move on. If you look at it from an environmental Kuznets curve point of view, developing countries are going to be the most important issue, especially if they're big. Where they are on the Kuznets curve is going to be a very big factor in the future trends of pollution, global warming. You may have had a hunch, and that was the build-up to me talking about India and China. Where are they on the curve? It's a very important point. It's obviously the left shift, and the population of the two countries combined is over 3 billion they still account for half of the global energy consumption. If the environmental Kuznets curve is correct, these two countries are going to get more polluted in the future. They have no choice but to use fossil fuels. They are not yet industrialized, so they have a long way to go. If you travel to any of the big cities in China, the air quality is so bad that you can't see 100 meters in front of you, and it's only going to get worse. 
And it's not much different in other countries with large populations. China and India are half of humanity. And let's take a look at what countries are there from number 1 to number 20. Indonesia, Pakistan, which is right next to India, Brazil, which has the largest jungle in the world, Bangladesh, which is also next to India. As an aside, Christianity is the religion with the most adherents in the world, but Islam is the religion with the most adherents, and Hinduism is going to catch up with Christianity soon. India is Hindu, Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh is Islamic, so it's a very large population. Going back to that, what do the top 20 most populous countries have in common? They're developing countries, with the exception of three countries, the United States, Japan, and Germany, they're poor or very poor. Let's interpret that. Most of the world is still on the left side of the Kuznets curve, which means the planet will become more polluted in the future. It's nothing to celebrate that some of the industrialized countries on the right side of the Kuznets curve are getting better. It doesn't matter if a few industrialized countries are getting better, they can't keep up with India, even if they put them all together. The extreme weather we experienced in 2023 and 2024 is just the beginning. Most countries still need coal and oil, and the majority of people are more concerned about making ends meet than the environment. My personal prediction is that next year's global temperature will be about one degree higher than this year. If you're thinking, one degree isn't a big deal, I recommend you watch my previous video first. If the average goes up another seven degrees, humans won't be able to live in the wild which is why I believe we're only about 10 to 15 years away from living completely in buildings. But let's go back to that. So, at this point, half of the global warming is coming from China and India. They're responsible for the emissions of all the rest of the world. Do you think India and China are suddenly going to go all in on green energy? Let's think about it. You might think, well, they're different, so why don't we just regulate them internationally? But, what does a hungry man see? when he's starving to death from poverty. Who cares what other countries say? We'll just keep burning efficient coal and oil, no matter what anyone else says. There's another saying. It's different when you go in the toilet than when you come out. How did the countries that are now in the ranks of the developed world get there? Who are the countries that are trying to minimize their carbon emissions? They're the countries that started the warming in the first place. They're the ones that used coal and oil like crazy during their industrialization their modernization. And so for a lot of the developing countries, including India and China, who are now following suit, it's just a classic ladder climbing. Just to explain a little bit about ladder climbing, it's a term for free trade and protectionism. What you hear in the developed world today is that countries claim to be free trade, but in fact they've grown up with protectionism. They're trying to prevent other countries from using the ladder that they've used, which is protectionism. In this context, it's called ladder clearing. The general idea is that countries with higher technology or productivity are better off with free trade, and countries with lower total factor productivity are better off with protectionism. Some of you might be thinking, well, we can just force them to stop using it, right? You might be thinking, well, the population is at least proportional to the military power, so only a few countries, including the US, can force them to stop using oil and coal. But that would mean World War III. India alone has 120 nuclear weapons, if you need to know. China has 400. Pakistan has about 150. North Korea probably has about 30. Russia has about 5,900, which is a country whose economy is going to the bottom. And at the same time, they have to use oil because of the cold weather. The United States has about 5,200 nukes. And it doesn't matter if they're efficient, because if you fight, both sides are just annihilated. There's no point in fighting. Either way, the moment they press the nuclear button, we're going to be living in the film Mad Max. It's not going to happen unless someone goes crazy. That's why there's a saying, it's scarier to have nothing to lose than to be strong. There's nothing scarier than this madman of the zone. There are some of those crazy leaders internationally. I'm not going to tell you who they are. I don't think I should. You can ask the question, isn't nuclear war too much? Yes, it is too much, but... There are plenty of reasons to limit the use of fossil fuels that don't involve nuclear war. First of all, of course, the oil exporting countries would be against it. So who produces and exports a lot of fossil fuels? Many of you probably think it's one of the countries in the Middle East. And while statistics vary slightly, the number one country is the United States. 
The U.S. has been the world's largest producer of crude oil since 2018. As of 2020, it produced 18.6 million barrels of crude oil per day, surpassing Saudi Arabia, Russia, and others to become the number one crude oil producer. It has even been said that it has become as crude oil powerful as the entire OPEC, which is dominated by Middle Eastern countries. The U.S. is also the world's third largest coal producer. Shale gas has played a big part in the U.S. surpassing the Middle East. We just dug it up and there it is, that's America. Can you feel the majesty of the mother of all nations? It's not just Silicon Valley and Wall Street. The U.S. is a resource powerhouse, so the tragedy of the commons doesn't apply to us either. We have the most fossil fuels in the world. Can we ever get rid of them? If you look at the ranking of natural gas production, even if it is not the United States, it is the United States, Russia, Iran, Canada, Qatar, and China. As long as the United States, Russia, and China are in the ranking, it is impossible to regulate natural gas. Even if all the Middle Eastern countries, which are oil powers, insist on not using oil themselves, if the US, China, and Russia oppose it, it's a problem, even if they go to the extreme of not exporting oil. I can count on one hand the number of countries that can build nuclear power plants with their own technology. Hydro, wind, and solar are too inefficient. There is so much time left for natural energy to become more efficient than oil that it's doubtful it will ever happen. Think of it this way. Would you wait for confetti to burn under a magnifying glass? Or would you burn it with a lighter? It's easy, right? So the developing countries I mentioned earlier will be the first to scream for oil. Even if they don't export, they'll be begging us to do it. We can't get to the roof because the ladders have been removed by the already well-off countries. Why don't you just ask them to give you a ladder to climb down? Anyway, when the end of humanity is coming due to climate change, the last people to survive will be those with money, power, or both. Those who have neither will disappear from history, starting with people or countries. Let's get this straight. The Earth's temperature is rising every year and the trend is accelerating. There are only seven biologically habitable degrees of temperature left in the natural state. Between 2023 and 2024 alone, the temperature rose by one degree. At this rate, in 10 or 15 years, humans will not be able to survive outside buildings. It's effectively biological extinction, and there's little room for this situation to improve. Fossil fuels have played the biggest role in the rise in global temperatures, and the richest countries in the world are the ones with the most fossil fuels. Look at the Kuznets curve. Most of humanity is on the left side of the curve. There are three scenarios. We can either industrialize and die from rising temperatures, or we can live in poverty for the rest of the world while the few industrialized nations survive, or we can say goodbye to the world in a nuclear war. That's it for today. Next time, I'll share my thoughts on how humanity will live in the future, whether it will stay on Earth or go to Mars like Elon Musk said. What are the films that depict this, and whether they are scientifically realistic? We might all be dead in 10 or 20 years anyway. So what's the harm in hitting like and subscribe? While you're at it, please share for the sake of humanity. Bye! Subscribe it.